הדוברת הראשונה שלנו היא פרופסור בירג'יט מייגה. בירג'יט היא שותפה מייסדת ונשיאת ה-International Service Design Network. היא עורכת ראשית של מגזין TouchPoint, כתב העת הבינלאומי ל-Service Design. מייסדת ומנהלת את ה-SEDES Research, אני מקווה שאני אומר את זה נכון, מרכז, מרכז מחקר לחקר ה-Service Design ב-University of Applied Sciences בקולון. בשנת 1995 בירג'יט הייתה הראשונה באירופה לקבל מינוי של פרופסור of Service Design מה-University of Applied Sciences, שוב בקולון. מאז היא פועלת לפיתוח תיאוריות, מתודולוגיות ועשייה בתחום. ההרצאות, הפרסומים והפרויקטים שביצע סייעו רבות בהטמעת ההבנה כי לעיצוב השפעה משמעותית על היבטים כלכליים, סביבתיים וחברתיים בעולם השירותים. הרצאתה של בירג'יט נקראת Service Design the Evolution of Design והיא תשוחח על העבר, ההווה והעתיד של התחום. בירג'יט, הבמה שלך. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Noam. Thank you very much, David, for introducing service design to HIT, uh, but also for having me. It's a great pleasure. I wish I could be with you in person, um, but I hope there will be an opportunity since now service design, design is taking up momentum. So indeed, um, I want to talk about uh, the evolution of design on the example of service design. And uh, I will go through this talk trying to not bore you too much with theory. I will uh, dive into two projects that are really quite interesting, one from the private sector and one from the public sector. And I will try to give a broad understanding of what service design is and, and how it works. So let's start with design. In the very past, design was very much seen as craftsmanship, close to art, a bit artistic. It was always about beauty, about styling, about the elegance and um, the appearance of things. But that has throughout the years changed. And today we can um, look at this definition by Tim Maun. He's the CEO of uh, IDEO, the, one of the world's most famous companies for innovation, also applying service design. They say design is a discipline that uses the designer's sensibility and methods to match people's needs with what is technologically feasible and what a viable business strategy can convert into customer value and market opportunity. So this is what we call the design triangle. It's uh, the people on the one hand side, what's the needs of people, mm, what experience do we want to offer them? On the other hand, it's technology, what opportunities, what resources, what options do we have to use technology in order to fulfill these needs and to create value? And last Last but not least, it's the business. So the designer is in the middle of this triangle. He needs to understand people, he needs to be savage about technology, and he needs to understand business uh, value. And business value does not always have to be monetary, and it can also be social or cultural value. So this is a set definition that I find like quite a good starting point if we want to look into design. Even based on this definition, design in the past has very much looked at the material artifacts, at the things that are tangible. And it could be trains, it could be cars, it could be furniture, it could be computer devices, whatever we are surrounded by in this world as a material artifact has been designed. When I started as a professor for service design in 1995, I was the world's first professor of service design. I stumbled over um, a quote by a um, German design theorist, Lucius Burkhardt, and he said, it is not the train that makes the travel a successful experience. It is the schedule. And I think you can all um, empathize with this. Um, how often were you annoyed you came from a party and of course public transport is there no there's no bus no train you have to go for the taxi and Lucius Borkert pointed out that when we as designers the world we should not only look at the material artifacts we should look at the systems they are embedded in and it is these systems that need to be designed if we want to create value for people 
Dieter Rahm said, good design is in constant evolution, just like culture and technology. I'm not sure that everybody is familiar with Dieter Rahm's. He is one of the icons of design. Uh, he was the first designer who really brought together the material artifacts like packaging products with stuff like corporate identity, corporate culture, um, architecture. So he designed for the German company Browns and uh, was very, very successful. He's an outstanding person. Uh, Jonathan Ivey from Apple was always referring to him as basically the, the godfather of, um, of design um, as it has been seen today. So it is a constant evolution. And as uh, was pointed out by David earlier, um, our culture, our economy, our technologies have significantly changed throughout the last decades. We have moved into a service economy where uh, the, um, people even say we are living in a service dominant logic of markets. In the end, everything is a service. The chair you are sitting on, table you are touching, the car you are using, everything is a service because it is producing value in use. Just through using it, it creates its value. And if you look at this, this bubble around the material artifacts, what is their value in use? It might inspire transformations in the way you design. So good design is in constant evolution just like culture and technology. So we have seen in the past fashion design, industrial design, product design, graphic design, packaging design, et cetera, et cetera. And we start now seeing things like interaction design, experience design, design thinking, system design, transformative design, and service design. So what is service design? How does it work? As I would bring two cases, and I'm going to start with one case. A case that we did with uh, in collaboration with the city of Eindhoven. Uh, Eindhoven is a city in Netherlands, and they are very design driven. They use design for safety, security, education, health. They really believe that design can make a difference. So they invited me and my students um, to work on a very difficult issue on uh, drug addicted street prostitution. So the fact that there is women who are drug addicted and who prostitute themselves on the street in order to earn money. The city had already abolished this prostitution from the streets in the city and they had created a specific area on the outskirts of Eindhoven, uh, right at the plant of Philips, uh, where the prostitutes uh, had specific safety boxes, where a container from the uh, Salvation Army was set up, where a security service was kind of like making sure that the women were not hurt too badly. So they kind of like taken that issue out of the city the outskirts, but there was still a lot of discussion on the money that was going into it. The city paid something like half a million euro per year in order to maintain this area. And also the moral issues around, you know, supporting drug addiction, supporting prostitution. So the city invited me and the students to work on that issue. We went to Eindhoven for two day, weeks, and that is something that is very specific about service design. You do exploration. You make sure you understand the system and not only in the very narrow sense of what uh, your client might give you as a briefing, but you try to broaden your understanding. That is one perspective to start creating stakeholder maps. You try to understand who are the, 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 the stakeholders, the actors involved in this issue. So we identify the caretakers, the women themselves, the politicians, the citizens, but also of course the pimps and the clients. For the little time we had, we focused our work on the politicians, the citizens, the women and the caretakers, because the pimps and the clients are very hard to reach. And we start to identify ways that we could do research with them. We had interviews with the Salvation Army, and uh, they were maintaining the container where there was coffee to the women and cake, condoms were provided, the women had warm place to make sure the makeup was done, and the caretakers just made sure that place was available. As it was really interesting to see that they had no sense of inspiring change, they had no sense of enabling other opportunities to make a living. So they were very much focused on keeping the status quo. 
was status quo, the container where the women could refresh themselves. And we found in our research that this was very much really focused on getting ready for prostitution. It had no inspiration at all for other opportunities to engage um, with, with life uh, in a social, in a, in a healthy way. Um, so after this part of the exploration, we started already asking these what if questions. What if the Salvation Army would see themselves as providers for inspiration of change? What if the container was a place where you had options, where you could potentially learn, where you potentially even earn money by doing what the Salvation Army is doing yourself? So we were kind of thinking about these what if um, questions. We talked, of course, to the women, and we found out that, uh, well, they uh, were very closely monitored by their pimps, so it was quite uh, kind of hard to reach out to them. What you see on the table here is the so-called design probes, those little bag, 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 black bags. Um, the design probes enable the participants of our research to collect research data themselves. So there's uh, little um, uh, dictaphones, there is uh, little blocks to take notes, there is other ways to collect evidence and enrich our research that is always limited through the time that we can spend uh, through their own observations and their own comments and opinions. So we talked to the women and we found uh, that uh, many of them had gone through detox up to 16 times. But when they came out of detox, detox, they had to ask people for a place to sleep because they had no home, they had no money, they had no job. So they had the detox. But then they afterwards went back to the so-called tipple zone, to this area, because they felt it's better than stealing. You can earn money there and... Uh, Going back to triple zone was then basically also going back to the drugs. So based on all these insights that we gained in exploration, we went into a creation and co-creation phase where we developed ideas together with the different stakeholders. And we came up with a concept that we call Lebenskracht, which means as much as living power in Dutch. And this is a concept that looks at the journey of the prostitutes from the moment that they start working Working at the um, at the tipple zone up to the moment that they ha that they have an independent life without without drug addiction. Um, so we designed ways of inspiration within the container. Uh, we created a system of caretakers that would be accompanying them from the very first moment that they came to the tipple zone up to the time after detox. So a one to one relationship. Um, we designed a credit system where women were able to already earn money during that time at the tipple zone beyond prostitution so that there's alternative ways of, of making a living. So lots and lots of uh, details. Um, we presented that concept to the city of Eindhoven and they were very much enthused by the holistic way, um, by the way that we really created relationship between the, poli the, the, the social system and the, the women and they implemented it in a test scenario uh, with three women whom they felt were sufficiently strong to go through that process. And it was very successful. And then they rolled it out uh, for all the women that were working there. And in the year uh, 2012, they closed the tipple zone. Um, they uh, had developed all the women through the process of detox, which does not mean that none of them work in prostitution anymore, but there is a different levels of prostitution and the drug addicted street prostitution is really the, the worst one where dignity is really hit, hit in the ground. So that was a project and it was a really challenging project to do it with students, um, but uh, it was, a I, I feel very successful um, project to see how service design approaches very wicked problems, um, wicked problems, problems that are very complex, that are not easy to solve, that are embedded in complex systems that you as a designer are not really in control. You are a person that can inspire, can develop options, can influence, can monitor, but you are not as if you were designing a table or a chair under control of the material that you are working with. 
So service design choreographs processes, technologies and interactions within complex systems and in order to create value or to co-create value for relevant stakeholders. That's the definition that I am using since 2010. Um, I find it quite appropriate because it keeps these keywords like choreography. It's a piece of art. It's a piece of, of you know, bringing a system together so it can basically dance and the different partners um, really, you know, work well with each other. It is in complex systems, as I said, not controllable with their own dynamics, interdependent subsystems. So you have to respect these systems. You have to be humble when you approach them and really see the role as, as the designer, as, a, as an explorer of a world um, who then co-creates with the experts and the users in the system uh, innovations that, that then have to create value not only for the end user, but also for other stakeholders in the system. Because if um, only the end user would have an advantage, nobody would have an interest to, to invest in implementation. So you have to really care for the different stakeholders, understand them and their needs just as much as the user's needs. This is a definition. Um, and this is the one visualization of a process. You might have seen that before. It's a very commonly used process, um, also called the double diamond. Uh, it has been launched by the UK Design Council uh, in the year 2005-ish, um, and it basically differentiates between um, two periods. The one is the period where you expand in order to discover as much knowledge as possible, and then you close, you converge again in order to define the key insights and the key problems, and then you open up again. Uh, asking opportunity questions, trying to develop many alternative ideas and concepts in order to then converge again um, and to identify a concept that can be delivered. So this is something that is used commonly uh, in service design, but also in what is called today design thinking. I personally do use it here and there. Sometimes I prefer this model because in the double diamond, the implementation is not really explicitly thought as part of the process. And I think in service design, you need to think about implementation and the options for implementation start already quite in the beginning of the process. If you don't have the right stakeholders involved, if you don't know what budgets are available, if you don't have the understanding of the resources in the system, then you can come up with beautiful concepts that will end up in drawers and not have a chance to be implemented. So I like this model because it includes implementation and because it also shows that it is an ongoing process. Service design is not something that you do and then it ends. Services are living products. They continuously develop just as the needs of users and markets uh, and technologies develop. So it is something that should be implemented in the genes of an organization to, to have a iterative um, approach to monitor the services and continuously innovate. There are a couple of principles. Service design is quite interdisciplinary. The service designer is not the expert for every market that he or she is working in. Uh, so you have to identify the right experts. You need different design skills. Sometimes you need graphic designers. Sometimes you need web design. Sometimes you need product design or architecture. So you have to identify, depending on the to uh, topic, who should be engaged in the service design project. Service design is very much about framing and reframing, which means, as I said earlier, the brief that a client gives you is not necessarily what you would want to do. Um, you have to question it because often enough people come up when they contact a designer and they think they already know the solution before they have even explored the problem. So then it's the role of the designer to help the client to better understand what is the, the, the context within which the design is implemented and what is the value it should create there. It might then really reframe what you will be doing. Zoom in and zoom out which means you have to understand the details. You have to really go into the system, but you also have to zoom out and see it in a more holistic way. How is it embedded in social issues, in ethical issues, in sustainable issues? Um, so depending on the topic, uh, this, this movement of zooming in and zooming out is something that will constantly be with you in the design process. 
think in processes and visualize them, map journeys, map systems, uh, map, map the, uh, the processes in the backstage, which then is called uh, blueprint. It's all about people, understand the people. It's not about technologies. Today in this world of rapidly emerging technologies, we are often tempted to design around technologies. Never forget technologies are only a mean, means of creating value for, for humans. But at the same time, maybe we are at the end of human-centered design because we have put humans into the center so long and uh, we have destroyed so much of the environment. You might you know, take a balance between system and human-centered design. Co-create, work with people, visualize and prototype. That's the strength of design to create scenarios of futures that do not yet exist. So visualize, make the things tangible, even though services are intangible and iterate. You can come up with ideas, um, have to constant, constantly you know, go back, test with the users, take the prototypes out into the world, collect feedback and iteratively improve uh, your, um, your concept. So those are some principles of service design. And you have seen now that in the first five years while I was starting service design, it was about experimentation. We did a lot of experiments in order to see how can design be applied to immaterial, to intangible services. And then in the year 2001 to 2010, I would say that the first design service design agencies came up. The UK Design Council started to invest in service design. We saw the first job postings for service design. Virgin Atlantic was the first company that ever publicly posted a job posting for a service designer. Came up with definitions, with processes, with methods. So it was a lot about framing. And then came the phase where suddenly service design started expanding. Uh, it was as if you had been shaking this Heinz ketchup bottle and you know no ketchup came on the plate and then suddenly woof, it was there. And I give you another example from that time of expansion. It was Lufthansa. Lufthansa is well known, so I don't need to explain much about it. They started to get curious about service design already in the year 2001. There they contacted me um, as a university professor and as the head of the Service Design Research Center and asked if we could not do a research for them about um, the travel experience on long distance travel for business first and economy class. Well, I said, that is interesting. Um, long, long distance travel and all three uh, classes, so we did observational studies, we did interviews with uh, persons, with uh, passengers, with the uh, crew. Uh, we did, sorry, contextual interviews, which means we flew and uh, while flying, we did interviews and observed. Um, we enabled self-exploration through design probes and we had workshops with the different stakeholders. In order then to come up with stakeholder maps, personas, journey maps, identify pain points and come up with opportunities. You can imagine it was an amazing research. Uh, we traveled a lot all over the world. And um, yeah, so after that, we went into creation. We had workshops, we did storytelling, we did brainstorming, we did enactment, which means, you know, really bringing different service scenarios on stage. And uh, from that, then we went to Frankfurt in September, on September 10th, 10th in 2011, in order to present our first storyboards. And that was, you know, we visualized the journeys and uh, we really showed, you know, what could the future of travel look like? And um, I'm not going into the details here. Uh, the whole room in Frankfurt was full of these concepts, these storyboards. and. Then after we said, now let's build the real concept on this, 9-11 came. So 9-11, all work that we did with Lufthansa was gone. And they had other concerns at that point. So it had not much contact with Lufthansa then until they approached me in 2015. And um, they asked if I could not do um, sorry, I was mixing up the dates, 2001, right? 9, 11, 2001. So they asked for a service design pitch. And what really fascinated me uh, is that 
they had briefing for that pitch that was super professional. They knew exactly what they wanted. They knew exactly that they wanted that research. They wanted to, the, the service design agency to take a really deep dive. Topic, by the way, was five-star business class. They wanted to be the first European airline to get the five-star business class. So they asked for that research. They asked for the interdisciplinarity, work in a holistic way, break through the organizational silos. They asked for the creativity, for the workshops, for thinking with the hands, for making things tangible. They asked for the prototype, learning to fail fast and really testing the concept with real end users. Um, and doing the iterations. So that was the, the pitch which I participated in. And unfortunately, me and my university research team lost the pitch. Who won? It was IDEO. IDEO, as I said, is the world's largest uh, agency for innovation. So that is something that you can live with as a university professor. And um, this is an example for the, for the prototype that IDEO built in Frankfurt. It's a one-to-one -one prototype of a Boeing. And in that Boeing, they tested two alternative uh, concepts for the service future of business class against each other, iterating, combining. Uh, and then in the end, they came up what they call the Lufthansa signature service. And indeed, today, uh, Lufthansa has the first five stars for an airline in Europe. So that was also quite a successful project. I could talk for another hour or so of the downsides of it, because indeed there was issues. It is very difficult to change such a huge, complex system. Um, the silos within that organization are huge. The onboard service, the onboarding, the um, um, ticketing, the um, airport experience, the luggage experience, they are all separated. And bringing these systems together and trying to find out something that, that connects, very difficult. Also very difficult, it's an international airline. They have flight attendants and persons uh, all over the world. And motivating them to apply the same process as defined in the signature service for Lufthansa again and again and again for every traveler, it's very difficult. I took part in, in some of the trainings that they did for the persons and the flight attendants. And there I found out that the training had not been designed by IDEO. The training had design, been designed by the HR department. And you could really sense that in the training process and motivation of the people who really then on the front stage are supposed to deliver the quality of the service, there was room for improvement. So as a service designer, you have a big challenge and uh, you have many partners that you're working with. Um, it's very difficult to control everything. Uh, but I think as we see here, the service design has a, has a great strength in making change happen. Another example for what happened then in the third phase and the expansion phase of service design is the UK uh, government. In already 2013, they announced that uh, all digital services from the UK government would have to be designed through service design. That was quite a big thing. Um, April 2014, it started and they prepared the organization by creating guides and resources for service managers, for content designers, for designers and developers, so that each role in the organization would have a clear understanding on how to apply service design to the development and delivery of digital services for the UK government. And as far as I know, there is one very specific rule before service is launched to the public, the, um, the minister in charge of that department would have to test it, just kind of to make sure that the ministers are not only living with the heads in the sky, but that they really know down to earth, what does it mean to register your dog in London? What does it mean to change your um, uh, license plate in London? So that they just understand and, and get a sense of, of what kind of services are being delivered digitally and with what quality. I have to say, when I first heard that, I was really touched because, as I said, in 1995, there was no service design. 
Of course, I dreamt of service design being distributed in the world, but I had never even dared to dream that the government would make this a standard for the de development of digital services. So um, let's talk about impact. Mm, when I started teaching and doing research, I always said, if you want to grow, and if you want to be successful, you have to measure. And from my experience of students in Cologne, measuring is not really the reason why they study. They want to be creative. Uh, they want to do things, but measuring numbers is not so. Mm. Listen, I think if you want to be successful and to share your success, not only with your peers, but also with the world of clients, which is potentially business, you need some numbers, you need impact. Um, so no matter if you're working in service design or other design disciplines, thinking about what do I want to achieve through my project and how would I be able to measure during and after the project, if I have achieved it, what types of quantitative data do I need to collect? What kind of qualitative data do I need to collect before, during and after the project in order to then be able to communicate about the worth, um, about the return of investment, about all those, those data that, that you know, make people trust that they are not wasting money when they you know, put money in your project. So, that's just an introduction to this. There is people, are people who are looking at uh, the growth of design and service design in the world. One of them is John Maeda. John Maeda was originally a really cool design manager. He worked for Philips. Um, and there, for example, he made an initiative, Sense and Simplicity, throughout the whole organization. Sense and Simplicity for products, for packaging, for the organization itself, for all the processes within the organization. So John Maeda was a designer, and then he moved to an organization called KPCB. And there he started to observe the markets. And he found that companies and especially consultancies are buying design and especially service design agencies. Um, this stops in 2015. In the last five years, there is so many service design agencies that have been acquired by uh, McKinsey, by PricewaterhouseCooper, uh, by uh, Accenture. You name them, you get them. So it seems that the tech companies and the consultancies have understood that design brings great strength to their portfolio. And uh, I know very well the example of Accenture, who already bought, uh, acquired uh, Fjord in 2013. They use Fjord as a service design agency to bring service design knowledge into the whole organization of Accenture and make sure that there is not just a tiny design or service design department um, somewhere in the org chart, but that this approach is distributed into the organization as a whole and that every manager and every mm, project owner knows that you do not jump on solutions without understanding the problem, that you have to identify the stakeholders, that you have to engage the users, that you have to visualize, that you have to test, that you have to iterate. So this kind of knowledge is brought into the organization. And that is something that you will find um, in, in many organizations. After I have stopped talking, I will post a link in the chat uh, or links where you can download publications in case you're interested. One is called Design Thinking In-House. It's a publication that I did together with a manager from the Deutsche Telekom. We show how service design, design thinking are being brought into the organization. And the final learning from that publication was it's everybody's responsibility. There will be always specialists, designers and service designers who really have the skills to systematically explore, create, uh, test, um, implement. But it's good if the organization as a whole, the culture, the mindset have already um, been exposed to this way of working. So I will publish these links a little bit later. So that was Jamaeda saying that there is a huge growth in service design, design thinking in that market, and um, that many, many companies are building in-house innovation labs in order to have people 
within the organization who know how to apply service design and design thinking to the challenges. McKinsey, uh, one of the large uh, worldwide consultants, they have their own design department, uh, McKinsey Design, and they have created something that I find really funny. It's the McKinsey Design Index, the MDI. Uh, the MDI is something that they regularly measure with their clients and other industries to find out how much design and how much service design do these organizations really live and not just talk about. So they have this MDI and then they found that companies with a high score on the MDI perform much better on regards of revenue. Now you might question what interest um, McKinsey Design has to, to publish such data, but I would say, even though they might not be 100% robust, it is arguments that show um, it is worth investing in design uh, and in service design. So uh, you might be curious what the MDI, what the McKinsey Design Index is. So unpacking it means that they look at in how far is design performance measured with the same rigor and revenues as, as, as revenues and costs. So uh, companies that use design in a very systematic way um, are more successful than others. Breaking down internal walls between physical, digital and service design. That I found really interesting. One success factor is that the different design disciplines are regarded as a whole and work hand in hand. And I think it's really funny because in university education and in practice, we as designers very often have silos and we preach to our clients that they should break down their silos. So I think McKinsey really put the finger on something that we as a design community need to reflect on how much confusion, how much um, uh, um, loss of synergy do we create by siloizing design in education and in uh, practice. By the way, I'm teaching in Cologne and what we do is we, we teach integrated design and we have been teaching integrated design since 1993. So that means the students are exposed to all different aspects of design uh, and they build their own specific portfolio through education where they do focus in the end maybe on service design, but they have been exposed to the design discipline as a whole. And I think that resonates well with what McKinsey says here. So the third point that McKinsey makes is that uh, companies that make youth-centric design, everybody's responsibility are more successful than others. That is what I just kind of showed at the by, uh, example of Accenture, that every employee and every manager should have been exposed to service design, design thinking, and make it as a, see it as a part of their responsibility and not only put, put point the finger at the design department and say they can do it, that will not work. And last but not least, de-risking development by continually listening, testing, and iterating with end users. So that means, as I said also earlier, service design and design is not a project that ends at a specific point. It is an ongoing process of listening, uh, testing, and iterating. And uh, so the, it's a circle game. Uh, so wrapping minutes, it up. Uh, Bridget. Yes? Three minutes. OK. Um, I see on my screen seven, but never mind. Um, I'm good. Mm. So, uh, yes, um, wrapping it up, the service design evolution started in an era in the 90s where we were very playfully framing on how can you use design, how can you map journey maps, how can you build personas. It was like really using the, the explorative and visual and creative skills of design and apply it to services. We had a very strong user focus. The end user was in the middle, in the center. We were very much focused on the development and application of method, method toolkits. Um, you will find in the internet beautiful cards and probe kits and all these tools that we use for exploration and creation. We came up with concepts that were partially then ending up in the drawers. And we were seen by our clients as external support, as partners that they would hire. Today, service design has a much more strategic focus. It has moved to the boardrooms. It is much more about de designing the future of the company on a cultural, organizational, um, and, and uh, product level. 
It's more of a system view, engaging all stakeholders and the environment and the ethics and all that. It's more about a mindset. The tools are important, but they are not as important as the mindset is. It's about implementation. Service design value shows when we are able to make change happen. And it has become, at the same time, an internal capacity that people rely on. So it's been quite a journey. So if you want to stay in touch with service design, you can um, yeah, connect with the service design network. We have membership, but we have community membership that is for free, and it will expose you to the latest information about stuff that is happening in uh, the world. We are also on Slack, so please, please, I'd be happy if you would connect. For now, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it was really, really great, I think, um, overview of this field. And I'm super happy with with the with the information that was presented. Um, I just um, there were like four questions in the in the Q and A. Um, two of them are in Hebrew and two of them are in English. So you can read the two that are English. But um, and and it was me that Mr. Fim Lichtov or Cheryl Tim that I I thought maybe the first one in Hebrew might be uh, quite interesting for the students. Um, can you please elaborate on the sort of projects that you do with your students in service design in Cologne? You know, as kind of just to give a kind of brief overview of the 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 sort of work that you do with your students there. Yeah, now it's a it's a broad variety. We work a lot with external clients um, right now. We have a long term collaboration with the city of Cologne. It's a three year collaboration. We have built an innovation lab for the city. Uh, we are educating the employees of the city in service design with my students. My students have been educated as facilitators. They support innovation projects within the city. Uh, right now, we are talking about um, citizen participation and we are creating mobile applications, physical and digital, in order to reach out to citizens and have them co-create the future of the uh, uh, public services in Cologne. This sounds spectacular, um, but it is in the end really difficult. Uh, it is not, um, it's not as you're taking a walk. There are lots and lots of obstacles. You're encountering the culture of the city. You are culture, you're encountering relations that you have to, you know, deal with. Um, but for the students, I think it is an amazing learning process. Um, and for the city as well, I think they take a lot out of that. Um, they really have a high respect for the students and they work on, on eye level with each other. Uh, three of my students have been hired by the city within the last two years. So it's not much, but it's, an, it's, it's a start. So that's one, one side. But I also work with, uh, with, um, with banks, for example. I've even done a bank project in Israel a couple of years ago. Um, I, <laughs> it was very interesting. Um, yeah, so with banks, uh, we created a, a stock market um, investment application for young people, um, crowdfunding, uh, crowd, crowd, um, uh, yeah, crowdfunding, where you put money together in order to buy stocks. Uh, that was really cool. So it's, it's really, really broad. Nice. Um, uh, second question is from uh, Ravid. Um, she says, um, in international projects like the Lufthansa project that you just shown, um, how do you take into account the cultural differences? Yeah, yeah that's a very, yeah. very, very good question. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a huge research project with Nokia, Siemens and McDonald's on uh, international service cultures. As you hear the names, Nokia, Siemens, it, it was years ago. Uh, and we started to develop um, guidelines, you know, how, how do you have to adapt services to international expectations uh, due to culture. Found, finding was that about 80% of the services can be designed through the lens of corporate culture. And the other 20% have to be designed through the lens of, of national culture. So within the Lufthansa system, of course, there is already embedded this adaption of services to, to the culture. Usually on the long distance flights, they have uh, the set of, of flight attendants that are from that culture. They have the food adapted. They have uh, um, yeah, the, the, the language adapted. Um, but still, I feel that uh, there could be done more. 
uh, as I said, I did not lead that project. It was IDEO who led it. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, focus they put on the on the adaption of the concept into the national culture. Uh, I know that Lufthansa has the set of regulations and requirements for national culture already, um, but I think it's a really important question and it would be a very interesting domain for more research. Great. Um, I think maybe we'll uh, call it that. There's a few more questions uh, on the chat, so you please feel free to to type in the answers uh, if you if you have the time. And, and I think uh, thank you, Bridget, again. And uh, we'll move on to our next talk.